Hello, welcome back to EE for Everyone, and the second half of our discussion about the common emitter amplifier. I've got some parts here on the bench that we're going to use to replicate the schematic that we were talking about in the previous video. The two capacitors that prevent DC from entering and messing with the bias point that we've established with our resistors, and one to prevent the DC voltage here from coupling onto the output. This should allow us to build the circuit, test it at a variety of frequencies, and then see how well it performs compared with the simulation, both gain at one frequency and frequency response as we do a frequency sweep. This should be a lot of fun. Let's get started. The first thing we have to do is recreate the schematic. Now, I couldn't find um, the 14K resistor, but I do have two 33K resistors. Unfortunately, they're in an 0603 surface mount package, so we're going to need to, uh, to work around that a little. But besides that, it looks like we'll be in pretty good shape. This is a special kind of proto board, which if I can get it to focus, you will be able to see has some wires, some traces connecting the pads together, but they're in groups of three. So there are lines of three traces connected together, which we will use to our advantage when trying to lay out this board to minimize the amount of point to point wires we're going to need. I will have one terminal block here with the input the input voltage, the output signal, as well as a ground connection for our oscilloscope, and then the uh, transistor, the 2N222, as specified in our LT-SPICE simulation and the other resistors required. Without further ado, let's go! Alright, we've got it soldered. Now, I gotta get some stuff configured here. Uh, we need to switch from build mode to uh, analysis mode. If the simulation was correct, and I soldered it together right, when we hook this up to power, hopefully, it'll turn on and we should see around five and a half volts on the output. So it looks like the impedance of the scope probe is so high. The impedance of the scope probe is so high that it's taking a long time to bring the RMS value of that signal down to zero volts. But it looks like we're getting there. 
and I'll take the waveform output 1, plug it into the input, and now we'll go ahead and turn on the wave gen. And we do not want an amplitude of 1 volt, because that should cause some serious clipping. We'll change it to 1 millivolt, or 5 millivolts. 1 kilohertz, run. Whoa, look at that. Our signal is coming through as we expected. You can see there's some noise. And I bet that noise is directly from the power supply. So we've got the waveform windows pulled up and you can see the signal, right? We turn on the wave jet and you can see the signal. I wonder if I can snap these to half. Doesn't look like it. So we have this set to a five millivolt sine wave. And we're getting out so we're getting 700 millivolts out, and we're putting 5 millivolts in. Cool. Though, uh, we were doing 0 to peak measurements before. So, there we go. There's our amplitude. Let's go ahead and change this to 10 millivolts, which is what we were using in our example. 10 millivolts gives us an amplitude of almost 700 millivolts. Wow, that is close. Considering that our base drive resistors aren't quite correct, that's pretty good. Because in our, in our simulation, this is 14K, but we used a 33K in parallel with a 20K, which is actually 12.45K. So this is actually, whew, didn't get any Sharpie on the desk, awesome. That's actually 12.45K, and this 10K is actually, or this 10 ohm is actually two 27 ohms in parallel, which is actually 13.5. So we'll have to take that into account, punch that back into LT spice when we're really doing our comparison. But we've got the wave gen set up, and we've got the signal coming out. So I say we do some frequency-dependent measurements and characterize the frequency response of the system. What this is going to bring up is it's going to bring up some, some points about the frequency domain. So then we're doing 10 millivolts. And let me, just, let me just make sure that the signal we're putting in is what I think it is. This is measuring an amplitude of 8 millivolts. And that should be pretty constant all the way. We'll just set this to 100k. And yeah, the amplitude is about the same. So I have it set to 1k, measuring an output amplitude of around 600 millivolts. We need to change the frequency to 5k, and we're still getting around 600, about 10k, still around 600, getting up to 50k, zoom in on the x-axis again, still around 600. Wow, this is performing a lot better than I expected it to. And let's bump this up to 100 kilohertz, which is where the simulation stopped. Wow, still around 600 millivolts. Well, let's see where we start to see some attenuation. And let's see if the simulation matches. 200 kilohertz, no appreciable attenuation. So at one megahertz, we're beginning to see some attenuation. And the amplitude is around uh, 575. And I'd expect to see a pretty consistent roll off beyond one megahertz. Yep, so now at two megahertz, we're seeing around 500. All right, we're, we can use this number 
and we can plug that into LT Spice and compare. I believe that at low frequency we'll see some attenuation due to the capacitors used to couple in energy. So we'll set this to 500 hertz and make sure that end matches as well. We'll go to 10 hertz, which is completely unfair. That's an entire decade that we just changed. And now that same input amplitude is getting 180 millivolts. Change that to 1 hertz, and it'll probably be pretty much no signal. Yeah, that's just the switching noise, and a tiny 1 hertz sine wave. We'll take this to back to LT Spice with this new graph, and we'll compare the gain and the frequency response to what we saw in LT Spice. I am amazed. I am amazed at how well that worked. So I'm just going in here and making the component changes. It's 12.45K and 13.5. And we need to change this to 8 milliohms. And we need to connect that to the input. And we'll go ahead and save. Go ahead and run. So we can see our input and we can see our output. And we will run the AC analysis. So we'll say do a bunch of points. We'll start at 10 hertz and we'll stop at 2 meg. Can we make this logarithmic scale? Awesome. The frequency domain is not like the time domain. See, in the time domain, when you want to add or subtract signals, you add or subtract. But in the frequency domain, when I wanted to subtract the input from the output, I needed to divide because Laplace transforms. <laughs> Which, uh, that's not really an answer, but it is an answer at the same time. It doesn't really explain it, but that's why. What we see is that going from 10 hertz to 100 hertz, that's where the capacitors are really blocking a lot of the signal on the input and output, attenuating the signal by uh, maybe 7 dB or so. And it's getting down to pretty much no signal. Um, a good rule of thumb is that 3 dB is dividing the power by 2. So keep that in mind. You know, 7 dB doesn't seem like a lot, but and that's a lot. That's more than dividing by 2 three times. <laughs> no, no, no. It's about, it, that's almost divided by 2 twice and a little bit more. But the two graphs are pretty similar. At around 100 hertz in both our collected data, and the LT spice simulation is the corner frequency where there isn't much attenuation from the capacitors. And then getting near one megahertz is the point where we start to see attenuation from the parasitic effects of the circuitry that we just put together. And in the middle is where the amplification is pretty stable with regards to frequency. It actually behaves a lot better than I remember when I studied this in school. Maybe I've just gotten smarter since I was in school, and that's why my common emitter amplifier works pretty well. This claims that we should see an amplification of 35, between 35.2 and 36 dB at its maximum, and we measured somewhere between 35 and 40. We measured 37 dB. So we measured a little bit more in reality than we did on paper, but uh, that's just due to the tolerance of the resistors. Uh, they aren't perfect, so I am 5% tolerance on every resistor. I'm sure we could measure every resistor independently, plug that into LT Spice, and then we'd see, oh yeah, yeah, we're getting 37 dB. But as far as rough order of magnitude, this is behaving in practice identically to the LT Spice simulation, which is really saying, the LT Spice model for the 2N222 transistor is very good. It's a very good model, very accurate. 
And you know, as long as we're at the bench, I think it's fair to show you what happens when this starts clipping. What happens when we give it input voltage where we don't have enough swing on the output to properly drive the signal. Here we can see the sine wave centered around zero. Three volts peak to peak, so 50 millivolts is still working fine. Let's crank up the amplitude some more, 75 millivolts. And we can see that now on the top half of the sine wave, that looks, looks pretty good, but on the bottom half we're getting this distortion. And this distortion is we're stealing enough base drive that we're hitting the lower limit of the rail. So you know our steady state bias is around uh yeah, there we go. Our steady state bias is around five and a half volts, and this sine wave is superimposed. But as that sine wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually you hit the rail. Well, let's see what happens if we drive it a little harder. Give it a hundred millivolts. Now we're really seeing that there's more headroom on the positive side then the negative, or our bias point, isn't centered around 6 volts. So we have about 6 volts of swing in either direction. And until we see that, this will get more and more rectangular on the bottom, and then eventually rectangular on the top as well. Let's change this to 150. Oh, 500 millivolts is not what I intended. Now there, we are fully saturated in both directions, really making a square wave. And the effect of this, if we were, if we were using like an audio signal, and we cranked the gain up, this would be the distortion that you hear in a class A amplifier. It's where the amplitude of your sine wave is getting so big that you don't have enough voltage on the input to your amplifier to properly output it. I just thought I'd show you what happens when an amplifier clips, as long as we were at the bench and with the signal generator and just demonstrate that the amplifier is really working just to take our input voltage and amplify it by its gain. If we wanted to tie, tie this closer to zero volts centered at any input, all we'd have to do is add um, you know, a 100K resistor or so on the output, between the output and the ground, and that would really help to drive this to center. You can see that after a while we get there anyway without that resistor, it just takes some time. Like always, I had a lot of fun at the shop with you today, and I hope that you enjoyed walking through building a common emitter transistor amplifier, testing it on the bench, and making sure that it performs as we expect from our LT Spice simulation. I really enjoy getting in the shop with you, and I was looking forward to making this video for about a week, so I hope that you enjoyed it too. I hope that you feel inspired to make a circuit like this one build it at home, and test it to make sure that it performs how you expect it to. If you enjoyed this video, let us know by hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, and leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye!